what do you think is the most amazing or maybe the coolest measurement device you've ever worked with or humans have ever built? Maybe for now, let's exclude the uh, background imaging of cosmic extragalactic polarization instruments. <laughs> yeah, I'm slightly biased towards that yes. particular instrument, but- we'll Talk I'll, about that in a little bit. Yeah, but certainly the telescope to me is, is a lever that has literally moved the earth. Uh, throughout history. So the OG telescope? The OG telescope, yeah. The one invented not by Galileo, as most people think, but by this guy Hans Lippershe in, uh, in the Netherlands. And, you know, it was kind of interesting because in the 1600s, 1400s, 1600s, it was the beginning of movable type. And so people, for the first time in history, uh, had a standard by which they could appraise their eyesight. So looking at a printed word now, we just take it for granted, 12-point font, whatever, and that's what the eye charts are based on. They're just fixed height. But back then, there, were no, there was no way to adjust your eyesight if you didn't have uh, you know, perfect vision. And there was no way to even tell if you had perfect vision or not until the Gutenberg Bible and mo movable type. And at that time, people realized, hey, wait, I can't read this. You know, My priest or my, my friend over here, he can read it, she can read it. I can't read it. What's going on? And that's when you know these people in, in, in Venice and in the Netherlands saw that they could take this kind of you know glass material and hold it up and maybe put another piece of glass material and it would make it clearer. And what was so interesting is that nobody thought to take that exact same device, you know, two lenses and go like, hmm, let me go like this and look at that bright thing in the sky over there uh, until Galileo. So Galileo didn't invent it, but he did something kind of amazing. He improved on it by a factor of 10. So he 10X'd it, which is almost as good as going from zero to one as going from, you know, one to 10. And when he did that, he really transformed both how we look at the universe and think about it, but also who we are as a, as a species, because we're using tools not to get food faster or to, you know, preserve, you know, uh, our, 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 our legacy for, the, for future generations, but actually to in increase the benefit of, to the human mind. Somebody mentioned this idea that uh, if humans weren't able to see the stars, maybe there was some, some kind of... Um make above the atmosphere, which for the early humans made it impossible to see the stars, that we would never develop human civilization, or at least raising the question of how important is it to look up to the sky and wonder what's out there, yeah. as opposed to, um, maybe this is an over-romanticized notion, but like looking at the ground, it feels like a little bit too much focused on survival, not being eaten by a bear slash lion. If you look up to the stars, you start to wonder what is my place in the universe. Do you, you think you think that's uh, modern humans romanticizing? I think it's a little romantic um, right. because they also took I the tried. same. <laughs> <laughs> they took the same two lenses and they looked inward, right? They looked at bacteria, they looked at you know hairs, and in other words, they made the microscope. Yeah. And we're still doing that. And so you know, to have a telescope is it serves a dual purpose. It's it's not only a way of looking out; it's looking in. But it's also looking back in time. In other words, you see a microscope, you don't think, oh, I'm, I'm seeing this thing as it was, you know, one nanosecond ago, light travels one foot per nanosecond. Uh, I'm seeing it, in a nan no, you don't think about it like that. But when you see something that's happening, you know, on Jupiter, the moon, Andromeda galaxy, you're seeing things, you know, back when Lucy was walking around the Serengeti Plains. And for that, I think that took then the knowledge of, you know, relativity and time travel and, and, and so forth. It took that before we could really say, oh, we, we really unlocked some cheat codes in the human brain. So I, I think that might be a little too much, but, but nevertheless, I mean, what's better than having a time machine? You know, it's like we can look back in time. We see things as they were, not as they are. And that allows us to do many things, including speculate about that. But one of the coolest things, I don't know if you're familiar with, so I'm a radio astronomer. I don't actually look through telescopes very often, uh, except, uh, you know, on rare occasions when I, when I take one out uh, to show the kids. But, um, but a radio telescope is even more sort of visceral. I mean, it's much less cool because you look at it and you're like, all right, it looks cool. It's kind of weird shaped thing. Looks like it belongs in sci-fi. It's going to blast, uh, you know, uh, the Death Star or whatever. But when you, um, when you realize that when you point a radio telescope at a distant object, if that object fills up what's called the beam, which is basically the uh, field of view of a radio telescope, it's called its beam. If you fill up the beam and you put a resistor, just a simple absorbing piece of material at the focus of the radio telescope, that resistor will come to the exact same temperature as the object that's looking at, which is pretty amazing. It means you're actually remotely measuring, you're taking the temperature of Jupiter or whatever in, in, in effect. And so it's, it's, it's allowing you to basically teleport 
And there's no other science that you can really do that, right? If you're an archaeologist, you can't. Let me get into my, you know, my my time machine and, and go back and see what was Lucy really like. You know, it's not possible. So the the same thing happens. This is where I've learned about this from March of the Penguins when the penguins huddle together. Mm -hmm. They, uh, you know, the the body temperature arrives to the same place. So you're you're doing this remotely. This yeah. is the March of the Penguins, but remote. And we do it from Antarctica too. So there are some penguins around when we do it. <laughs>